I cannot think of a topic right now that is more relevant and to the health of not only ourselves, human, the human being species, but uh, to our oceans and to all the wildlife and the cetaceans. So um, I think we're going to hear a lot of not only, you know, we know the challenges, but we're going to hear some good solutions tonight too. So, um, cause Look at what Marcy has brought with her. <laughs> All right, so by way of background, Marcy Rostad is the Chief Operating Officer for Think Beyond Plastics. It's an innovation accelerator focused solely on finding upstream solutions to the growing plastic pollution problem. Uh, she oversees the annual Innovation Accelerator Program, the launch of the Innovation Center for the New Plastics Economy, co-located at Cal State Monterey Bay, and the expansion of user facilities across the globe. She brings so much experience. She's had um, headed a nonprofit in Carmel called Meet Earth that's doing tremendous work around education and getting in touch with the food that we eat and how we grow it. So Marcy, take it away. And again, thanks so much for being here. Shut your cell phones off, please. <laughs> put in one other plug for our website. Um, I do encourage everyone to check out our website, acs-sfbay.org, especially our new page that has to do with taking action. It's a really um, important place to go and to check out. Great. Well, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here because um, I'm always excited to be with a group of folks with a passion. You know, we all have different passions, so I'm not here as an expert on the ocean, and I'm not here as an expert on whales, so if you have any of those questions, you're going to have to direct them to your board. Um, and so, but I have a really strong passion around the youth in our world, and also about the environment that we're leaving behind for them. So I'm going to tell you a really quick story before I dig into my presentation to tell you a little bit more about who I am. Um, especially after dinner tonight, listening to everybody and all their adventures on the ocean. So I grew up in Nebraska, which is a completely landlocked state. Um, I hadn't seen the ocean until I was 21 wow. when I came to California. Wow. And so I'd been on little lakes and I'd been on the Missouri River. But of course the ocean was a whole new thing. So as soon as I got out here, I had a new boyfriend. He decided I absolutely had to go out fishing with him. And I'm like, you're going to do it, right? So it turned out to be a terrible day. The drama mean wasn't even close. <laughs> I had not a great time on this boat. But I, I tried so hard to just endure and get through it. So many years pass after my one first experience on the ocean, and I was a little hesitant again. My son was in third grade, and as part of third grade, they go on whale watching trips. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let my first experience beat me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a parent. You know, I'm going to go on the boat, and I'm going to go whale watching. And so I not only got drama me, but I got the ear patch and everything. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can to have a good time on this trip. And so we go out, and they, they go all the way out. We don't see a thing. We're, they're like, we're going to have to turn around and go, you know, got to take them back, right? We're like two-thirds of the way back in. We still have not seen one thing, not a whale, not anything. The kids are all, you know. And all of a sudden, there's all these dolphins. I don't think that this is dolphins. That show up, and they're just riding the wave on the front of the boat. And there must have been, I mean, there were at least 100, maybe more. And they were all out there just jumping, and the kids were screaming with delight. And it was just such a wonderful experience. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. But, but I have had additional experiences on the ocean. I do think it's such an important and powerful part of the ecosystem and of our lives, which is part of the reason that my passions have expanded beyond just educating youth and getting involved with Think Beyond Plastic. And my, my expertise really is in business and nonprofits. And the work that I do is around helping these innovators figure out how to get to market. So um, with that said, let's, uh, let's go to the slides. 
And so I, I want to start by saying, you know, plastic is being demonized today. Um, it probably deserves to be. However, <laughs> however, it's such a valuable material. It has changed society. We do things, we think about things, we have experiences that we would never have had had plastics never come into existence. And perhaps... Is that too, too, too dark? Too dark. Too dark. <laughs> There'll yes. be... This is the, the writing on this slide is a little hard, but... Um, so yes, and I need to see my notes. So I'm going to have you take oh, those. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I wish there were half. half Can you half. do half? No, um, no dimming. No. So as far as plastics go, we, you know, we really have to work with industry and the petroleum industry and whatever to figure out what the solutions are because it's not like materials with these characteristics are going to go away. They're lightweight. They're flexible. They're strong. They're they're all these different. Um, uh, characteristics so we need to develop a respect for what we've created mankind has created this thing and we should treat it like gold or silver or whatever something that never goes away it should be treated like that but it's not it's not how we treat it and innovation which is what think beyond plastic is all about is what's going to help be a big part of the solution okay so next slide so um hit it one more time so I'm going to get a little bit of audience participation. So how many plastic bags do you think are used per minute? Mm. Per minute in the world? One million. It's a, he hit it, one million. So there's one million bags used per minute. So if you think about that, that's 1.4 billion bags per day that are used around the globe. So when you think about getting that bag at the grocery store or you forgot to take it in, you should go back out and get your reusable bags. Okay, next question. So the first one, how much plastic is produced each year around the globe? <laughs> and, and keep in mind, plastic is really lightweight. That's one of its most astounding characteristics. Any guesses? Kilos or pounds? Uh, tons. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I heard one guess over here. A hundred million. So triple that. Three hundred million tons of plastic, as lightweight as it is, is produced around the globe. And how much of it do you think ends up in the ocean? And actually, Gemma Jambach from uh, University of Georgia has done a lot of research, and they now have estimates. So if you hit it one more time, they will tell you. So eight million tons of the three hundred tons that are produced each year end up in the mm. ocean. It's something like backing garbage trucks up constantly and just dumping it, dumping it into the ocean. So, so with that, let me tell you what the talk is about this evening. So first we're going to talk about the problem. It's a, it's a very large problem. We're going to talk about scale and the effects and kind of why traditional approaches to solving this is not working. I'm going to talk about Think Beyond Plastic and all my little display um, examples for you. Then the Innovation Center, uh, the work that we're doing now and the work that we're expanding to do in the future. A really exciting project that we're doing on a Mesoamerican reef uh, down in Honduras so that you can mm -hmm. see kind of uh, some of other work in action and then what's happening in California. So that's a lot. I'm going to try to go through these with some speed. Um, and if you have questions, though, I'm happy to kind of take them as we go because I think that it's relevant because there's pieces of this I can chop off if we don't have enough time, but I've got all the important stuff at the front. Okay, so the problem. The problem is, you see this first picture? That's baled drip tape. And you know how we've got a water problem in California and we're trying to really be careful right. about water? Well, this is the solution that ag in California is using. So, it's, so it, it saves a lot of water but they get one to three uses out of this drip tape. And then it goes and it gets baled like that and it's so dirty that there's not too much you can do with it. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm gonna be at a big sustainability meeting on Thursday in Monterey County where there's tons of ag. And we're gonna be talking about those problems because that cannot continue. We can't keep doing that. So there's about 130 million, of the 300 million tons, about 130 million tons goes to just packaging alone. And, and think about how much plastic is in cars and all these other things. I mean, packaging is just packaging. It comes off, it gets thrown away. 
Um, and then the number of PET bottles. Mm. PET bottles per year, 500 billion PET bottles per year based on our habits of just buying drinks and thinking we can recycle the bottle, um, which would come to 1.3 billion per day around the world are the bottles that are being all right, so the next slide. We're just getting happier and happier. <laughs> so here's my final sobering thought before we talk about something else. So if you look um, on the zero year side, the things like paper towels, newspapers, cotton rope, you know, your wool socks, plywood, you know, within five years, those things completely biodegrade and they disappear and they're part of the carbon and, uh, you know, all the things that good things are made out of. But if you move over right there in the middle where they're estimating 450 years disposable diapers, mm. think about that, wow. and plastic bottles, mm. they're estimating 450 years. Mm. So how long can we keep doing that? It's, it's a pretty sobering thought. Is that saying that those are actually biodegrading in that amount of time, or are they just disintegrating? No, it's just an estimate. Yeah, there, it's just an estimate of it, it's all the plastic is going to outlive, you know, anyone who's on Earth today. <laughs> any piece of plastic that you have will be around when we're not. Just like the cockroaches, they'll still be here too with the plastic. <laughs> um, aren't cigarette filters also another big? I know they're one of the more popular pieces of waste. Notion there's plastic. Yeah. There. So is that like a spun fiber? Of some kind. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. That has not come up in my conversations, but that's a good point. Okay, so let's talk about a few more facts. Um, so we know it lasts a long time. Only about 14% of plastic actually gets collected and into the recycling system here in the States. Um, I talked about the, I got ahead of myself on the weight of the fish in the ocean or the plastic. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the plastic packaging. So 14% gets recycled, of that 8% goes to a lower value usage. So if you take your PET bottle and it gets turned into something else that's not PET and not recyclable, then you know, you've, you've lost the value in that. Um, and you actually get 4% loss just in the process of processing it. So we only end up with about 2% of plastic that gets reprocessed into something of equal value to where it started. So we have a really long way to go. So um, there's, you know, the realization we keep saying, the throwaway, there is no away. When it comes to plastic, there is no way. There's, there's really no way for it to disappear. So let's look at, this is the system we're talking about today. We've got 78 million tons going through the system. It's linear. 98% of it is from brand new feedstock meaning it's petroleum-based, uh, they're just churning out new. From a mature, you know, and think about fossil fuels took millions of years to be created. And then we're using this material to make something like a fork that you're gonna throw away as soon as you finish the takeout meal that it was given to you. So it's completely, it's completely out of balance. So we talked about the 14% recycling, 40% goes to landfill. 40%, you know, it's packaging, it's non-recyclable, people put it in the trash. And then you have 32% leakage, and this is where a lot of the materials making it into the ocean, is all this leakage that's, that's coming out. And it's in this linear model, so there it is, it's falling out right into the ocean with the fish. So the next slide, this is what is being worked on in Europe. They actually are having very in-depth, uh, difficult conversations about circular economy and plastics and clothing and electronics and all those things that we just can't keep putting in the dump. So the most important thing is to create, to have the visual, you know, the process of this circularness to our plastics use so that so that it gets reused and it's used in a valuable way. And we need to separate the feedstock, and they use the word feedstock to mean what you're making it out of. So petroleum is a feedstock, so is cellulose from trees, so is the chaff from the marijuana plants that are growing everywhere all over California and Washington and Oregon. So is the field waste that's left behind when you harvest lettuce 
uh, broccoli, cauliflower, all those things. Those all could be feedstocks to make materials out of. So let's talk environmental impacts. I think for most of you, you're quite aware of these, but up in the left-hand corner is the microplastics. So the microplastics come from a, a variety of different things. In some, for I think in California and maybe across the U.S., they've now banned microplastics out of like facial scrubs and things like that. I mean, they were producing these and they were just going down the drain and right out into the environment. And then you've got plastics that, as they break down, they don't really biodegrade. I mean, they degrade, but they don't biodegrade and disappear. They just break into small pieces and become micro. So they're actually putting ultra microplastic beads in chewing gum now. What? Is this a new Japanese? Is it flav flavored or something? No. That sounds yeah. horrible. It's a good question. Um, so, so in terms of environmental impacts, we need to think about plastic like icebergs. You know, you can only see a small portion of it. So left, less than half of the plastics that are made at float. The rest sink. So the concept that we're, I mean, we've got a lot of cleanup to do, but the concept that if we go clean the five gyres off the top, that somehow we will have magically cleaned the oceans, it's only a small portion of the overall problem that we need to solve. Um, so anyway, you can see the picture here, environmental microplastic ingestion. So ingestion by animals and entanglement, obviously, are really big issues. But the ingestion, you know, it's all the way through the food chain now. I mean, we're, eat, we're eating things that have eaten microplastics, which is not a good, uh, healthy thing to be doing. And then also, plastics are transportation for invasive species. So they can ride on pieces of plastic that are floating from one place to another, and you're moving... Um, you're moving a fair number of uh, creatures around the ocean that weren't intended to be in different places. So mm -hmm. it's, um, and some of the numbers that we have here is 245 different species have been found to have ingested marine plastic. And then 275 species they found entangled in, you know, um, the nets and different kinds of plastic that's, mm -hmm. that's out, out in our oceans. Let's talk about human health. This is something that is not well understood, not well studied, but it's clear that there are certain things that, um, you know, what, 15 years ago, there was all the baby bottles and the drinking bottles and they eliminated things with certain kinds of linings because they had some evidence that there were problems with it. But that is really on the be only the beginning. Every piece of plastic um, is made from chemicals and it has you know, off-gassing and leaching that happens if you put it in water especially. So those things come out. So it is changing the makeup of the land chemistry and the water chemistry. And it's interesting, I didn't include any of these, but China's used a lot of land-based plastics in their agriculture, but they've not done a good job of collecting it. They now have massive acreages that the toxicity of the plastic, because it's just been tilled into the soil, mm -hmm. is essentially, it's, it's, it's ruined. You know, it, it won't grow anything anymore. So the toxicity that's in this plastic, we don't yet fully understand. And there's actually studies that have been done. The statistic is 93% of Americans age six and older test positive for BPA, one of the better known endocrine disruptors that are added to plastics. It's one of the additives. So, you know, we don't yet know um, the total health impacts and, you know, it could be related to all kinds of things that haven't yet been studied or determined. And then economic costs. So, this also, there aren't good models yet. I mean, right now, those who are producing plastic are not bearing the costs of plastic. Society is bearing the cost. The economic models you know, they're, they're working on things, and the UN has worked at trying to put a price tag on it. And right now they're saying it's about 100, I'm sorry, 13 billion US dollars a year that they're considering the, the negative ex externality of plastic. But they're, you know, mm. there's much work to be done in this area around economic challenges. And if you think about, you know, island societies and you know, all the communities that rely on fishing and rely on 
um, you know, the ocean as a food source and their economy and whatever. And that is being destroyed in Indonesia and all kinds of places just by the amount of plastic that's piling up and the change just in the ecosystem. You know, there, there just aren't the fish or anything that there used to be. And my logos, for some reason, when I, it, it went crazy. So that's not really our logo, but it was supposed to be. So go to the next slide. You did it in both places. So what, what happened? I don't know. Technology. You just never know. So, so think beyond plastic. So in the introduction, so we're an innovation accelerator. And you know, what that means is we're just trying to help these innovators who can be anywhere from a 21 year old in high school, I'm sorry, in college, to, let's see, um, where's my VTT example, to, um, to VTT Finland, which is a big research institute. And they're trying to figure out how to do the licensing now on this brand new material made from wood, wood fiber. Um, we're assisting them move through the process that it takes, which includes protecting their intellectual property. How does this young man keep someone else from just going and copying this design, which is a really wonderful origami shaped cup, you can drink coffee out of, that doesn't require a lid. Cool. And it's got this really cool little, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be a spaz right here in front of everybody. But it's got a drinking spout. It doesn't need a lid. It's as spill proof as a cup with a lid, maybe more so because you can't pop it off. It, it's going to stay put. So there's all kinds of, you know, this is a design that's going to make a big difference. Um, it's not a new material, but it's a new design. So these are the kinds of things that we're working on. And so, there's three components to this ecosystem. There's the innovators, then there's the big industry. They need to adopt these. So Coke, you know, Coca-Cola, um, you know, the big water companies that are putting plastic on everything. They need to be adopting these. So we're working with the industry, and we also work with investors. So we're working to match investors to the innovation. So, for example, this company is working with L'Oreal. So they've got a big infusion. And L'Oreal, this is their new product line called Seed Phytonutrients. Doesn't look like a big name brand. Doesn't look like a little, little local organic brand or something. But it's made from completely recycled material. There's a small amount of plastic, but it's all recycled plastic. It's made from recycled cardboard. And so these can go through the, re the current recycling system. It just, as it goes through, it pops these. It's got a patented uh, way that, that, that it goes together. And it's at least the next interim step of eliminating all the heavy plastic on that kind of packaging. And they're getting a lot of international attention. So this company was in, you know, was an Excel in our accelerator class four years ago. So we're a nonprofit because it takes a long time for these to come to fruition. So, and we don't have any conflicts of interest. We can have six companies working on the same problem in the accelerator. We're not, you know, we're not looking for one to be a winner. This is, it's market-based. Whoever can be successful, and a lot of it is based on the entrepreneur. Do they have the characteristics? Can they be the CEO? Can they actually take this to the next step and get it into the marketplace like this? And, like, what's the accelerator when you say that? Uh, accelerator just means we bring them in at whatever state they are and we give them education, training, access to mentors, um, help them develop, uh, we require them to go out and talk to 50 customers so that they know exactly what their value proposition is. They need to put a pitch deck together for, their, for the, um, the funders and, you know, and, and investors so that they, they can actually articulate what it is they're trying to make happen. Um, so it really is it helps them protect their intellectual property so that someone doesn't steal their idea before they can. Um, and all of this is done through mentors and relationships. So, and this little company, so they're making, it's pretty beat up, I need new samples. But they, they one of the new um, exciting developments is edible packaging. Mm -hmm. And so this is made from seaweed and it's edible if you wanted to. They're making flavored ones. Straws. Mm -hmm. They're straws. Oh. So mm -hmm. this little group called Lollyware, this is their lolly straw. <laughs> These are their Lollyware cups. 
um, wrapped in plastic because there's no alternative at this point. Um, but it's edible, so it is a big new trend is edible materials, or even looking at things like that you could wrap a hamburger in an edible, I mean, you could eat it if you wanted to, but it will be bio waste just like food waste. You know, it can be composted right with the, uh, right with the food. And so there's opportunities that that kind of a material might also work for forks, spoons, knives, plates, things like that. And uh, I was at the Schmidt Marine Partners Mixer in San Francisco last week. And I met a young man that I'm interested to learn more about, that they're looking at mega farming of seaweed and things out 100 miles off the coast in the open ocean. So I'm really intrigued how that's going to work. But it probably is the only way that if this is a material of the future, to have enough of it to do the kinds of things with that we need. So they claim totally environmental. It's great. It takes carbon out of the air. It like does all, cleans the ocean, all these things. So I, I hope it's all true. OK. <laughs> So we have three different areas that we work in. We've talked we talk somewhat about the Innovation Center and what we do with the entrepreneurs, but I also want to talk about how do we find these folks? Where do they come from? So one, they find us, but two, we are always partnering on innovation challenges. Last year, our biggest one was with the Alan MacArthur Foundation out of the UK, and they partnered with the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Foundation and the Prince of Wales, who's also very much into the environment. And they sponsored a $2 million prize purse for innovation in the new plastics economy. And so we have 11 winners from that, and some of them are some of the things that you're seeing here, to just spur people to bring forward their ideas. This, this young man was one of the winners out of the $2 million competition. So, it's really um, an interesting array of different things. So we do these challenges. We're working on one with Canada. So I think in 2019, we'll be doing an innovation challenge with Canada, you know, and hopefully the best, brightest, best ideas, you know, they float to the top. They get evaluated by, you know, a jury of folks that said, yep, that's, that looks really promising. So let's see what we can do and uh, get them moving ahead. Um, talked about the Innovation Center. Um, and our next phase will be uh, testing facilities for the entrepreneurs. So if you're making a new material, um, I don't really have a new material here, but let's just say this particular, uh, it's a clear packaging made from wood fibers, a cellulose. This is done by VTT. So you, you need to test this. You need to see whether oxygen can go through it. You need to see its strength. You need to... Um, if it's waterproof, you know, how long is it going to take it to break down? You know, what's its shelf life? All those things. So we're working, the hardest thing for these entrepreneurs is they can't get into a lab to test this stuff. If you can get into a university or an FDA lab or whatever, it's like, okay, you have an afternoon three months from now. Or you can, and what they need is to sit in the lab for three months and do their testing. So that's been a big need that's been identified. So we're, we're working on user facilities. And then the Mesoamerican Reef, which I'm going to talk about um, and kind of give you an insight on how we're, we're going after this from multiple dimensions. So I don't want you to look at what's all here. All I want you to see is there's kind of a funnel. We go out, we find these folks, we bring them in, we get them all together, you get them all jazzed up, they meet each other. It's interesting all the things that can happen because they know people who know people who know people. And um, our entrepreneurs are all over the world. So right now we have folks in Brazil, uh, Germany, Indonesia, Canada, United States, Czech Republic, uh, Finland, you know, they're, they're just all over. So we do all of this by video conference and webinars, and, but twice, twice during their program we all get together in one place. So this year's kickoff was in Zurich, and we'll be concluding it in Frankfurt this year. So. Um, so we take them through all their activities, and hopefully they start as, you know, kind of this immature, great idea, and by the time we get them a year down the road, they're much further, but then it, it still continues to take time. So we will, we work with them and mentor them like lolly straw. Um, they were in the Innovation Accelerator four years ago as well, but right now Disney wants these. Mm -hmm. 
all the big, you know, the big hotels want them. So do you find at that stage, like with Lolly or um, the other where the investment that then comes in, does it come in from VCs or is it coming in from the corporations as a? It's all of the above. It really depends on the innovation. Um, some things, when they get mature enough, the, the investment community gets interested, but they want to make sure it's kind of over the hump. Yeah. Um, some of them are getting grant dollars from different places. I mean, Schmidt Marine is a good example. They, they give some, they're actually just grants. Uh, USAID or USAID, mm -hmm. um, they give grants to innovators. There's a whole variety, so we're always working to find things and match make depending on what their particular innovation is, because okay. it does vary, it varies a lot. Okay, so the next, so then, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of like the moonshot, right? The moonshot innovations. And this is interesting, because we don't have it yet. We don't have a moonshot for plastics. So, you know, what we're looking for is a bio-benign material that's made from renewable sources that's not food grade. So we don't want to be making that out of corn, rice, uh, sugar beets, you know, all these other things that could be food. You know, we don't want to take the resources that could be used for food. It needs to be moisture resistant and biodegradable, and we need firm definitions on what biodegradable means. <laughs> um, they need to be gas impermeable with a long shelf life and being free of synthetic chemicals. There is such a thing growing now, emerging as the green chemistry. You know, there are healthier compounds that can be used in a chema, um, I'm sorry, dechema in Germany is one of those big groups that's working on green chemistry and we are partnering with them now. Um, it also needs to be, um, have strong economic properties and performance specifications so that it meets what plastic provides. I mean, right now there just isn't anything yet quite like it and it needs to be commercially scalable. So that's the moonshot. I mean, it's good. we put that up there for people because this doesn't exist yet. But this is this is the holy grail. This is what what we're looking for. Okay. So next, so I've talked about some of the innovations. So I have some of these up here. Um, so we have the uh, the green garmento, which is a made from a natural fabric, but it's to get people to stop using the plastic bags from the dry cleaner. So they make a dry cleaning bag, mm. and then these really wonderful handled bags that you, you can really carry many more things because it's got it's much, much sturdier and it will um, it's got more integrity than the bags you're trying to get things in um, and I talked about the edible materials that is a really big trend so we've got um, some of the edible materials here this is Eva where you know all the cups of noodles really big in Asia we also have them a lot of kids love to eat out of those and they sell them at the cafeteria and schools and they have that little seasoning packet in it <laughs> that's nothing but trash so Evo where where they started was they were working on a replacement for that so it is a seaweed based material it will hold the spices when you pour in the hot water it dissolves so it just becomes part of the food so uh, again edibles you're gonna see a lot about are there allergen edibles. issues with any of this I'm sorry? Allergen issues? You know, not to my knowledge, but that's an interesting question. I'll have to uh, note that and ask. So, the, going back a slide or two, you were talking about like non-food grade part of that. I mean, I, you know, for whatever reason, I, I know that this country makes, makes so much food that we export. So, I'm not exactly sure why that would be. Why it doesn't? Well, because um, it takes water and all kinds of resources to produce food grade. So you, we should be using uh, uh, an available waste material that maybe is a byproduct of those things as opposed to actually using. It's like the ethanol thing is the craziest thing ever. And, you know, I'm from the Midwest. I mean, every. <laughs> It, it's just you're using something, you're using all that resource to grow the grain, and then you've got to use water again to process it, and then you sell it cheap. <laughs> and then ethanol stuff gets worse, worse yeah, by miles per gallon. Right. So, so, so it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, if we can find the ways to make materials from cellulose that's not 
patrol, you know, and it's not a petroleum-based product, then. Um, and the other thing that's happening um, is a really interesting thing is a new material made from waste methane. So every landfill vents methane. I guess methane's now bubbling up from the bottom of the ocean as well that I hear. But I'll just hand these around. This is made from waste methane from the Bay Area, actually, um, by a little company called Mango Materials. And it can be spun, woven, hard, um, and they're working on all the testing, but it appears to be fully biodegradable. It's different than the, it seems like it's still a gas that maybe it would have the same characteristics, but it's tr it, it appears that we're closing in on a possibility. And of course, it's a renewable resource. <laughs> it's something we need to get rid of. It's causing global warming. So if we can capture waste methane and we can turn it into usable materials that are bio-benign, then that would be a great thing. Um, and then this is just an example. This is a company that's now using, you can see what you can do with 3D printing. They create filament from, you know, uh, waste. So this is a reuse and actually the, just an example of the potential to upcycle thing. So if you've got 3D printers and you're using recycled plastic materials to create new things, especially in low income where you could, you could make chairs and tables and and things, and then it's made from material that could be used again. You could just repurpose them once that, that thing breaks, you can put it back back into the system. But the other thing I want to talk about is distribution. So right here, and I'm oh, sorry, we, we can't blow this up bigger, or the quality, for some reason, it's not projecting as well as I hope. Um, you know, we've got the refillables, and then new distribution. So especially in low income, one of these is coming out of Brazil that people in poverty are buying in these little tiny small sachets, these little small quantities. What they're doing is producing automated vending type equipment that will use reusable containers. And so people can get their shampoo, their laundry soap, their whatever in like, you know, two ounce portions if that's what they want because it's all they can afford to buy. But they're because right now, the, there's a poverty penalty. You pay for packaging on this little small thing. And so every time you buy, you're buying packaging again and again and again. So if you can get rid of the packaging and the poverty penalty, you know, we create a, a big win-win solution. And so we even have a, a company called Happy Circle in Indonesia that's employing women. They actually go around they, they've got refillable bottles, they have women on bikes that started out as bike lady, where they go around to all the homes, they pick up the empty containers, they take them back, they get refilled, they go back out, and they're creating their own little mini micro industry of refillable products, um, and it seems to be taking off. And then we also have a producer out of the Czech Republic, and they're actually looking at more high-end distribution. You know, people who are really they're thinking about the environment. And so they're, they're designing a whole system where if you were gonna buy flour, you know, they've got big shipping containers that the flour will come in. It'll come and it'll sit in a distribution <coughs> piece of equipment that might fill a whole wall. And then th the machine will, I mean, you could like say, I want uh, three pounds. It'll put three pounds, it'll drop three pounds of that into whatever your container you're gonna use. and it'll automatically price it. I mean, some of these may not even need anyone to do the financial transaction. It's a bulk buy. It's a bulk buy. And they're actually looking at, could they actually put the ability to pay in the container? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So that you might buy your container and the container has three refills and you can renew, you know, the only time you're gonna do a transaction is when you're gonna add value to the container. I don't know. That's, I mean, that was a new one. So it sounds really interesting. And then the one I don't want to forget, there's so many good things. This is a microfiber catcher. So everybody, when you wash your clothes, all this wears synthetic clothing. It's all made of plastic. We wear plastic, we eat plastic. It's in your wash. It comes out, you know, the little tiny fibers. Right now, water treatment systems aren't really set up to filter those out. So it's making its way right out into the ocean and into the land and into our rivers. But this is a microfiber catcher called the Coraball, and it is out. It's made from recycled plastics, 
and um, they're just getting ready to start to market these as well. So you can see they take multiple years. It just takes a while to get your minimum viable product. You test it out. You get your pricing. You get your your investment money. And then this is a new gen surgical has a skin stapler that you know. Did you know every time you go in, somebody staples your skin up? They throw away the stapler <laughs> because it's plastic. Um, so this actually has made us something called bagasse, which is the residue from sugar cane. So once they process it, you have this fiber left. So this is made from that, and so are these particular items. So a company called Pulpworks, um, these you can go online and buy. Uh, they can, what's great about it is you can mold this to any shape. It's so shiny and stuff, you'd almost think it might be plastic in, in the room, if you want to see it. Um, but you can make it look fancy, you can, um, Anthropology used them for Christmas decorations a couple years ago. And you can shape them so they have very strong integrity. So this is shipping container for very expensive whiskey glasses. But you see how it's built up the structure so that it's got the shipping shipping strength so you can just touch it. Is this, this a local see. company? Um, yes, actually they're up here. Yeah. They've been around a long time. They it's have. Good to see that they but they, have. but they've, uh, he, it's been, and it's quite a story because the, the yeah. gentleman who started it started when he was 56 or 51. But anyway, it was like a whole second career for him. What does it mean? Pardon? What does it mean? It's called bagasse, which is the residue from sugar cane. When you process it, you have all this fiber left, and it's very moldable. So they take it and they put it in molds, but they can color it, they can shape it. it. It works a lot like plastic. I mean, you could envision a plastic package that looks like that shape or something, but it's actually a, a fully biodegradable product. Okay, those are lots of my toys. I love all these things. This is our big circular economy drawing. That's enough of that. Is that, that an innovation um, from a... There can be innovation in any part oh, okay. of this. But this is the model. That right. This is the more involved model that when we're talking to you know, players that are working on different yeah. pieces of it, it's important for them to understand where they fit in this whole picture because obviously you can get pretty focused in on your part of this. Right. You know, whether you're in the recycling or the collecting or the cleanup or, you know, production, you're producing these things, or you need to use the materials again in, hopefully, upcycle things so that you don't lose the value out of the material. So that's our fancy drawing. And then here's where we just wanted to show, internationally, we're working on partnerships in all these geographies to have user facilities so that bright innovators can get in and they can work on their stuff. So. These will be through partnerships with big lab facilities that exist in these other locations that have committed to partner with us and create um, opportunities to accelerate this work um, as rapidly as possible. So we expect we'll have our the rest of our California Center open in the next um, 12 months, and also we've got two in Europe that's pretty much ready to go. And where's the California Center? So it's in Monterey, Cal State Monterey Bay. We're partnering with them. Um, to put in our user facility. We're actually going to be putting it in a building they purchased that used to be, sadly, the old newspaper production building. Mm -hmm. So it's got this really, one, it's got this huge warehouse, so there's lots of space for people to hang out and do whatever they're going to do. And the, where the printing presses used to be is the most interesting, unusual space. It's, you know, part of it's open two stories because of the size of the presses. I mean, it's very interesting. It's got a dark room, so it's got, I don't know if you've ever seen the little circular door things, but you can go in the tube, you turn the door, and you come on the other side so that no light can get in. Anyway, those are still in there, so we think we're going to leave those in just for fun because, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Where else in the U.S.? So in the U.S., we're, um, it's the, there's some old 3M facilities that they're working on putting in some lab, a big lab testing space. In Minnesota? It's not actually Minnesota, it's further east than that. <laughs> they were just generally dropped on the map to show the geographies that were having conversations with all the different research institutes and things. Okay, so let me show you, this is my fun picture. So these, these companies are, they either mentor entrepreneurs 
or they're interested in, you know, they're sustainably focused companies that want to um, get access to what these entrepreneurs are doing or maybe get in early. Um, mm -hmm. They're all working with the UN and with the Al MacArthur Foundation on defining what is biodegradability, what is not, what is, you know, what does toxicity mean, what is non-toxic. So we've got a whole variety of folks and we hope to just keep adding to that. Some of them are doing um, policy work, As You Sow, Has, have any of you heard of As You Sow? They're a California nonprofit that they work at the corporate level. They go into stake or shareholder meetings and they're advocating like at Starbucks, like you've got to stop doing what you're doing and getting enough of the shareholders to actually get policy passed at the corporate level. So um, they're an excellent group. So we've got all kinds. So let me talk about the Mesoamerican group. How are we doing on time? Are we good? Um, okay. We'll just talk a little bit about the reef, so we'll go through this quick. So the Mesoamerican Reef, it's it's down along the Honduras and Mexico for, uh, coast. Um, there's three islands there that we're working with off of Honduras. So they're Honduran islands. And it's an opportunity for some of our entrepreneurs to test their products. And it's also an opportunity to test out systems like what can be done in island communities because they have many big issues including safe water how do you get water water right now comes in bottles there's huge issues with water I mean that was like one of the things once we got in and started working the biggest issues are water and teen pregnancy you know it must be in the water um, so so we're working on the reef so there's three islands we're working with and so if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see the picture. So the islands are down here on the Honduras side. We've been working with it, them for three years and we're hoping to start to move up into Mexico with this project now onto some of the other islands. And it's a three-prong program. So if you go to the next, oh, let me talk about the region. Um, so it's really heavy tourism, lots of scuba diving on the reef. Um, you know, the ecosystem is experiencing degradation. There's a lot of plastic on some of the beaches. Their mangrove uh, forests are highly impacted by the plastic because they don't really have waste treatment. A lot of times they just go dump it in the mangrove oh. forest. So it's all just sitting out there. A lot of them are out on the coast, so it just washes the water. So it's kind of like it's a dump on one side of the island and it's uh, diving on the other, you know? So you can't see it, it must not be there. Um, it, but one of the big problems, they lack alternatives. You know, it's not like a mainland where you just have something brought in and you go buy it somewhere else, or you order on Amazon and you're all set to go. There's really <laughs> poor economic conditions. You know, there's a lot of people in poverty. There's waste pickers that are out in all this waste trying to find whatever bottle or thing that's got a value. Uh, however, the government there is pretty enlightened. They're really excited to work on these problems and they've, they've done some really progressive work. So, and the mayors, I mean, the mayor, the, the mayor of the largest city, those are the political leaders in these um, communities. There's some good local activism, especially in the diving community, they're really, and the, uh, the hospitality industry there. And they do have some of their own entrepreneurs and innovators that are excited, they just need resources to help them. So that's, um, after three years, you know, we're, we're finally getting the lay of the land and there's good partnerships that have been formed. And on the next slide, one part of our project was to actually assess how much plastic is, is being processed, you know, being utilized on this island. So from 16 to 17, we worked with the local community and the hotels and whatever, and had some great grad students we put to work, and they did some estimates on, you know, the plastic use compared to like paper. So in this time period, they had 41.5 million uses of all the single-use plastics versus only 10 of the paper and one of our big goals is to get a distributor on the islands that can bring in the alternatives because there's there's no good way right now to buy in volume do all the things so that people have so that the the businesses there have access to alternatives so this was our hot spots around the materials if you go to the next slide we're working on education and outreach business development and policy 
And then our next steps with them, you know, we're, we're continuing education campaign. We're going to be working on a business competition, and we've got some grants out. We're hoping to actually put in a business development center there, nice. where, especially for women entrepreneurs, um, there's some new businesses are getting started reusing flip flops and making all kinds of artistic things out of them. So we're hoping to kind of nurture some of that. Is there any chance you can go back one slide? And we're continuing to work on the, the policy pieces. I mean, the policy is essential, and you know, it's, it's understandable why that's such a powerful, powerful tool. All right, let's talk about California. So let's talk about bringing this all home. Okay, talk about the world, talk about the Honduran Islands. So now, like, what's happening here? So if we go to the next slide. Um, so in California, um, you know, we, we do have a lot going on. Um, I have a few things I might actually read here that are the stats so that I get this right. I don't remember them all. So San Francisco Bay has a higher concentration of microplastics than other urban water bodies studied to date in the U.S., including the Great Lakes and Chesapeake Bay. Ooh. <laughs> Up to two million microplastics per square kilometer occur in its surface water. This is San Francisco Bay. Much of it synthetic microfibers from clothing and other textiles. Eight wastewater management treatment plants discharged to the bay mm -hmm. for an estimated seven million mi microplastic particles per day. Mm. Um, the problem is not contained within um, a few bays, however. 25% of fish and shellfish for sale at markets sampled across California contain plastic debris in their digestive tracts. So that's 25%. Um, debris studies in the Monterey Bay, which is down by me, have found on average 38 debris items per 100 meter transects, and the plastic debris was actually more common at depths greater than 2,000 feet. Hmm. So it just shows, you know, it's, it's all through it. Um, and then, you know, kind of on a brighter note, you know, California was one of the first to actually put in place a plastic bag ban. You know, we're, we're environmentally conscious. You know, there, there are a large number of people who are interested in this topic. Plastic film, you know, anything that's a wrapper, uh, plastic wrap, whatever, not reusable, not recyclable completely trash, so trying to really think about how we eliminate that. Um, we need the expanded polystyrene, you know, the things that balloon up, those things are really bad. And then the pouches, I mean, is every darn thing in a pouch now, baby food, baby juice, you know, all kinds of things used to come in a nice little glass jar, <laughs> fully recyclable is now in a pouch. Every one of those pouches, the Capri Suns, the orange, the juices, that is all trash. There's just nothing you can do with it. So we've converted from re reusable materials and the pouches are one of the worst offenders. And that is, that is on exponential growth. Part of that is because they can heat process in those pouches. So you could put in like raw applesauce and they put it through heat, a heat process, and sterilize it in the package. So there's very few other packaging that you can do that with. Plus you've got to have the layers are so that the acid in the food doesn't eat through it. You know, there's a layer to keep the oxygen from going in and out so that it stays fresh. Then there's the outside that can be printed on so you can put your beautiful brand on it. And you get this really ugly waste that's left. I mean, I need to talk about the fiber, but so I want to talk about the export market a little bit. I talked about this at dinner a little bit. So China used to take a fair amount of our plastic and they had waste pickers and they'd come in in bales and they didn't really have standards about how the quality of those materials. Well, that show is over. So it was over at the beginning of the year. And so China really is taking a very small amount at this point for waste uh, materials. So what's happening for us, we've got 46% of our plastics are being landfilled. Um, you know, you can see exported recyclables, 14%. And there's other, other things that are happening, you know, including mulching and composting and different things. But the, uh, the China, um, 
the China factor is big. So if you go to the next slide, and I read these, it's okay. So this is unsorted paper. So we've got a little bit of a paper problem. Yeah. This is last year, this is this year. Yeah. Okay, 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. And these are the plastics. So you can see they're taking a small amount of PET if it's perfectly sorted, but no PVC, talking about PVC and what we put in our yards and that, um, I'm sorry, this was other plastics, not PET, and this is PET. I mean, they're just not taking it. So, so there's a lot of bundled, I don't know if you've ever seen a bundle of these, but they accrue pretty fast. And you know, some of it is going to Vietnam, they're starting to take some of it now, but it really isn't a solution. I mean, it really is a crisis for us and we need to come up with answers because you know, th these bundles are accruing in places and waste management uh, <coughs> processors are having a really hard time figuring out where they're going to go. Yeah. So the obvious question is why don't they want it anymore? Well, because uh, we were sending poor quality material that wasn't clean or well sorted. Um, so, and there, what they did with the rest of it was they incinerated it so they're belching all that chemical into the air so they're trying to clean up their air and they are trying to become a better world partner and um they're you know it it isn't in their best interest they're also generating a lot of it now internally yeah, in their they, own they exactly yeah so. exactly you know, so, so anyway, we we've, we've got a crisis on our hands with our own waste waste management, and then recycling center closures. Those little dots all represent closures. So we've had a lot of closures in California. Why is that? It's because the plastic's not worth anything. So it used to be when when petroleum prices were higher, and it costs more, the waste plastic was worth more. But now that it's so cheap to make virgin plastic. They, you know, the recyclers that would set up, there's, they can't get anything for it. So there's no use in being business. They're losing money. So they can't even afford to put somebody out there to collect it because there's no market. There's no aftermarket, which is what we have to change. So, so anyway, um, kind of wrapping up, you know, what can we all do? Obviously, we can all be individuals that are making a difference obviously you're all advocates you know we all have our causes and we're working in different ways these are some examples of things that have you know um, groups that are working on different things they're all important everything's important the cleanups are important <laughs> the new policies are important and then we've got to get the we've got to get the alternatives and really amp up you know our moonshot wherever it is you know whoever's going to make the the discovery and also if there's anyone who says to you what about those little microbes they're going to eat all of it I have a great scientist at the University of Michigan that would like to talk to you um, in that at this point that is not the solution we would never unleash a microbe into the world to eat plastic that we have no idea what it's going to produce or do I mean so for people who think they can just keep using pl plastic because somehow there's going to be this magic bullet you know I mean, we need to think again. Um, I, I had a few people at my last presentation go, but isn't that the answer? I'm like, no, yeah, it's not. And let me let me connect you to people who can talk to you about that in more detail. To stop buying plastic. We need to stop using yeah. this plastic. Yes, for sure. I was wondering when you were. I'm excited about the innovation um, pieces, and especially around straws, because I. Um, work for an environmental ed group and we really you know, like you know, straws and as a for people with disabilities and she's like there's not a good alternative right now that's affordable and so to ban straws is not I like the like straw on demand kind of yeah and there but there's lots of solutions I mean another one we've got a gentleman in Zimbabwe that there's some natural growing plant that this is their stock. So, yeah, so I think there's like hope. There's all kinds of alternatives. Right now they've, they've had people do, like people with disabilities doing the studies, comparing like affordability, usability. You know, it seems just like with the carbon tax, 
that we really have to factor in the environmental cost of these cheap products we're making, just like gasoline really costs a lot more than what we pay. Correct. Sure. I mean, I would agree with you, which is why policy, the policy components, and again, there's more will in Europe and other countries than there is here. Yeah. You know, we, uh, you know, I think there could be some political will in California, but, you know, and and maybe New York and a few places, but right now we're not, <laughs> we're lining other pockets, I believe, um, and we're not willing to put those policies in place. The big thing is though, all of our companies, if they want to compete internationally, are going to have to meet the standards and the requirements around the world. So it's going to make me so angry when I'm watching it happen there and they're still going to be doing the same old thing here because they can. I, I, that's disturbing. So on the note of political will, there is a company called the California Product Stewardship Council who is looking to place the waste stream back to the people who produced the actual product instead of having each individual city and county pay for that waste stream to have it go back to the company that produced it and they have to deal with it, which would make them right. re-innovate right then and then. Which is great. Are they local or where are they? You know, I, uh, we went to a class called the Environmental Forum of Marin and they came and spoke to us. Um, but I haven't heard anything about them since, so I don't know Maybe how. Maybe afterwards I could get that written down. So right on my brain doesn't lose it. I hear you. Before the end. <laughs> I think there will be better ways to deal with our problem, but the, the play, paving the roads is really, you know, one of the worst ideas ever because we'll never be able to retrieve the microplastics. It also has to be education to get people to use it because I don't think people realize that they're dumping little <coughs> pounds of this polyester fiber into our drinking right. water. Right, especially if you love fleece clothing and all that really super soft stuff. <laughs> it's just Excuse me. Worse. Uh, how long does one of those balls last? You I know, it depends on I don't know the answer. I mean, uh, the way that they set it up is that once they're full, they actually go back in to be cleaned because you can't really get everything out of them. Um, so, um, I, d I don't. I mean, I'm sure it depends on what kind of clothes you wash, how frequently, yeah, sure. all those kinds of things. But and I might. Did I miss someone else over here? Well, that I don't know what those things are. Those so it's it's to catch microfibers in your washing machine. Mm -hmm. So they they will help grab all the little fibers and help reduce how much is actually escaping into the water, the water system.